How's it going tonight, Kellen? It's going awesome. I'm, I'm sorry that it's late. I forgot I had to do a quiz. No problem. Sorry. Okay. Dude, to start this off, cannot believe the Bucks lost. Can you hear my mic? Am I good? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, fine. sick. Dude, yeah, the Bucks, how did I don't know how they lost. The Bears actually look hella raw. And I got Allen Robinson in a trade. I traded away Lamar Jackson. So I was pretty stoked to get another wide receiver one in there. Cause Teddy Bridgewater, he's gonna be playing the Falcons, and the Falcons are literally the worst team, worst defense in football. So yeah, I think I might I'm just gonna stick with him for I can't believe you traded your boy Lamar. Yeah, but Lamar's was a li- he's a little bit dinged up, and I was like, I really need some more consistent play for my wide receiver. So now I've got I, I I drafted him, but then I traded him away. But now I have him back, and he's so good. I don't Mitchell Trubisky wasn't getting him the ball enough, but oh, yeah. now Nick not Nick Foles is the that game yeah. the game that just went down was weird because like Tom Brady on that final drive he forgot it was um, fourth <laughs> forgot. Down. Yeah, did you watch all of it? Yeah, I watched the end of it. Yeah, it was a re- it was actually a pretty decent game. Like the Bucks were in pretty much control the entire time until like um the the Bears went down, they scored a touchdown, right? And then that Kyle Fuller forced like a fumble, and then the whole tide turned after that. But yeah, it was a good game. It was a good game. So like basically this episode we're going to be talking about i just want to do like a quick ufc thing it doesn't this one doesn't have to be long at all but did you look up any of the fights you it's actually going to be pretty good and it's just on espn plus it's going to be a really good card i didn't look it up but is it just going to be your typical sort of fight night Mm -hmm. yes but we've got two crazy good bantamweights going at it in the main event in Corey sanhagen and um marlon marais so basically my fellow friends, it's like, it's going to be a pretty good prelims fight, like prelim card. Like you've got Imp- Impa Kasunga and I fighting Joaquin Buckley. Joaquin Buckley came is coming off a tough knockout against, um, what's his name? Uh, big long guy, dude. Oh my God. I'm spacing on his name. Uh, dude, he literally just fought. Oh my God. Um, Oh yeah, Kevin Holland. Yes, and then Emma Kasung and I. He was like on Dana White's Contender Series, and he got um, a fight against Maki Batolo and ended up beating him in unanimous decision. It wasn't even really that close of a fight, and that's basically the biggest fight that stands out on the prelims. And then the the main event. I mean, the um, main card's really good. You got Yusef Solal, who is a, such a good striker, super dynamic, and he's coming off a big win against. Peter, I think it's, yeah, Peter Barrett. I'm um, Peter Barrett, pretty good. He's older, but he's kind of crafty. Um, but yeah, really good win for Yusuf Salal there. He's gonna he's fighting. I have, I have no idea, bro. I don't even know if this cat's even fought in the UFC. Yeah, he hasn't. His name's like Ilya Toporia, and I have no idea like him at all. But I'm pretty sure Yusuf Salal is going to take this dub. But what do I even know? I don't even know anything about UFC anymore after literally losing every single fight but yeah and then tom aspinall he's the second fight up there really like i don't know he was he i haven't really there's not a big sample size from him yet because he got a really quick knockout in his uh debut which was against jack collier back in i want to say let me check yeah july uh or jake collier and jake collier he's kind of like he, he was a weird situation where I'm pretty sure he was at middleweight or something and he moved up to heavyweight and that's just not the move for him. He, he did not look good there at all. And Aspinall managed to put him away pretty early. And as for his opponent, no idea, bro. Like Alon uh, Badal from France, I think. Dude, they're like, I honestly, when they're going to fight Island, they're not, they don't have really a good idea of who's gonna fight on the cards i don't think oh because like i've been i've been literally in the looking, air still huh yeah a lot of it up in the air with all the testing and stuff still. I, yeah it's really it's odd because like i don't know if they're gonna be back in america for the uriah hall anderson silva stuff but they have like four people on that fight card and it's that's on halloween 
So, I mean, like, that's pretty close. You know what I mean? Usually they have these fights booked, but they're not. Um, But, yeah, like, oh, that reminds me. Conor McGregor and Dustin Poirier are in talks of fighting. I really hope that happens in November, if not in December, because I just want to see Conor McGregor back in the octagon, and that'll be so good for the UFC because, I don't know, like, the pay-per-views that they put on are pretty good, but for some reason, like, let me see. The never the Daniel Cormier versus Stipe pay-per-view was pretty decent, but this la like the last one, like the, even the Kamara Usman versus Jorge Masvidal, like that wasn't a very competitive fight. And also this last one between Israel Adesanya and Paulo Costa, not competitive at all. So I think it'll be really good if they book this pay-per-view for November, December, because it's actually going to be a really good fight because Dustin Poirier is completely different from when they fought at Feather when Connor fought him at Featherweight and put him out of there. I think it was in the first round. Um, that was back in like, like 2014 or 2015 or something crazy like that. And I think it'll be, that'll be, that's going to be awesome if the UFC can put that together. Cause it was kind of like, Connor and Dustin wanted to do that on their own. And I was like, bro, that's kind of wild because, you know, honestly, what's stopping some of these big, powerful guys from just doing promotions on their own and doing charity events? Like that would be the scariest thing for me if I was a promoter, if guys just got so big and like, um, you know, like didn't even need the platform of the UFC anymore. Right. Yeah. They just get too big and they transcend the sport and they can just do whatever they want on their own. Like that's gotta be kind of scary, but a lot of some of those fighters, like that, those guys are few and far between, you know, but, um, yeah. So we've got, what, who did I say? So we've got Impica Sangana versus Walking Buckley. That's going to be a good one. Yusef Sivalal versus Ilya Tupur, Tupuria and then Tom Aspinall. And then, um, as for another fight on the main, like the main ish card, there's not really, it's all kind of just a blur, like because the prelims and main event it's all like the same thing basically um until you get to the main event um especially on non-pay-per-view cards but like i've never even heard of marcus perez or Doricus du plessis no idea who any of these people are um like if i was to guess I couldn't give you a good guess because don't know who these guys are. And Ben Rothwell, Ben Rothwell is going to be like the co-co main event. He came off, he's coming off a split decision dub off of Ovin St. Peru. And, uh, which was close. Ovin St. Peru looked hella good for being a heavy for his first fight at heavyweight. And then he's fighting like Marcin Tibera, who's a big guy, but, um, yeah, he, he beat Maxim Grisham in the Usman versus, uh, Masvidal pay-per-view, which was good. And then he beat, I think it's Sergey Spivak. And so I, I think I've watched both of those fights. He's, he's pretty good, but I got to go with Ben Rothwell on this one. He's just, he's a stud and Ovin St. Peru is like a world-class striker. And he hung with him, even though he got rocked a few times in their fight, but he hung with Ovin St. Peru. And so probably going to go with big Ben on that one, just because of the resume for sure. Cause he's literally fought like, Stefan Struve, Andre Arlovsky, Junior Dos Santos, Blago I- Ivanov, Ovin St. Pru, and Mar- Marcin Tibera does not have that type of resume. Um, and then also, I'm going to take back what I said. Remember how I said that like, Paulo Costa versus Israel Adesanya is going to be like fight of the night, I mean, fight of the year, which yeah. it ended up not even being close to fight of the year. I honestly think that the co main event for this card could be fight of the year because we've got Mac on Amir Connie who's 18 and four or 16 and four absolute stud coming off a big dub um, in he fought on the Masvidal Usman card as well and he beat um, Danny Henry who I mean he's decent he lost to Dan Ige and he's beat like Daniel Tamer and Dewadu. Like, oh wait. 
Akeem Duwadu. Oh, Akeem Mean Duwadu. Oh, dude, he uh, Duwadu is actually not bad. He uh, he beat Hakeem Duwadu. That's sick. Hakeem Duwadu just fought in this last pay per view and beat um, Zabira Tugov, who's a stud. So I mean, Danny Henry is a beast. So Mac one Amir Connie. I mean, I wouldn't say he's fought like the best guys, but he's really explosive and he can pretty much do it all. Like he can wrestle, he can grapple, but he can also, he has such dynamic striking, which is wild. And so it's going to be really interesting to see what happens when he fights Edson Barboza, who's literally a world-class striker, moved down to featherweight um, to fight Danny Ige. Um, and so I think this will be a second fight at 145. Yeah, because he got... Yeah, because he got knocked out by Justin Gaethje. Um, he lost a close fight to Paul Felder back like last September, right? Yeah. And then lost a close fight to Danny Gay, which I thought he won. But he's literally like one of the best strikers in the world. And so this is going to be – this is a crazy good matchup. Huge step up in competition for Maquan. But I think he's ready for the test. Like he's, he's in his prime. He's around his – he's like 31 now. And so – I think he's ready for this and he's ready to be a featherweight contender and he can definitely hang with the best one. I mean, he's one of my favorite players to play with in UFC four. That's for sure. Because like no one will shoot on him because he's a good wrestler and his striking's hella good. So look for this one to be fireworks. I don't know. Maybe if things go kind of rough for Ed's, I mean, for Mac Juan on the feet, he's going to end up taking it to the ground, but Edson Barboza, dude, He's a beast. He tends to gas out a little bit because he's so explosive and he has a, he's absolutely shredded. He was already shredded at 155 and he looked like a freaking Olympic runner at 145 because it didn't look like he had much to lose at all. Um, so Edson Barboza, I could see him maybe winning or like winning the fight early. I don't, I don't know if I see a finish in this fight just because of how good both of these guys are. Um, I look for Mac one to win this fight, but I really like Edson too, but I see Edson having success early on his feet and Mac one having to adjust, take the fight to the ground and maybe get a submission. But yeah, this fight ha has potential to be fight of the year. And it also, I couldn't tell you where it's going to go. Cause obviously Edson's a way better striker than he is a grappler, but he is obviously world-class at everything he does. So it's going to be super sick. Um, and then as for the main event, Marlon Marais versus Corey Sanhagen, like Corey Sanhagen got, I don't know, like his confidence definitely took a hit. He got submitted by Aljamain Sterling, like in 25 seconds and the, on the Amanda Nunes, um, pay-per-view, I don't like, like a few months ago. And he said he was surprised that he got this opportunity and he definitely needs to make the most of it because Marlon Marais I mean, like, I don't know, like Marlon Marais, he's tough. And I don't know if Corey Sanhagen is going to get the dub here, but the, the biggest advantage for Corey Sanhagen is to just keep guys at bay with his length. Cause he's literally, he's almost six feet tall, 135. Like, and he makes the 135 pound weight division, which is wild. So like, he just has to find ways to maybe take this fight to the ground. Cause I don't know if you want to really stand with Marlon Marais here because he's an absolute beast. You're just going to want to, keep him at bay and kind of probably take him into some deep water because he tends to get a little bit tired as the fight goes on. Like in my opinion, he Jose Aldo beat Marlon Marais. Um, but obviously the judges didn't see it that way. And that's what led to Jose Aldo getting his title shot against uh, Peter Jan. But yeah, dude, I see Corey Sanhagen maybe getting a submission here. I really like Marlon Marais, but Corey Sanhagen, he, I think he understands um, that he is in a tough spot here because if he loses this fight, although it is to, I'm pre pretty sure it's the number one uh, contender in the bantamweight division. Even if you lose, that's tough. Like you're going to be waiting in line a lot more. You need to take advantage of this opportunity. Like Marlon Marais has already been there. He fought uh, Henry Cejudo for the vacant bantamweight strap and, lost that fight because Henry Cejudo is like the ultimate badass. But I see Corey Sanhagen taking this fight just because I see him being a little more motivated to kind of get a dub. This is like Marlon Marais is like third consecutive or yeah, third consecutive massive fight. 
So, and he's only actually, I think he's only gone five rounds like once before this. And I know Corey singing just based off his frame, you know, he can go for days and I'm pretty sure he trains that are like Colorado. Yeah. Team elevation. So yeah, he can go for days for sure. And he, yeah, just being around that team, like cardio is big for them. Um, but yeah, I'll go through it again. So got Yusef Solal, Tom Aspinall. Don't know. Probably go with Perez just because he has a picture on the ESPN website. And then he's, I'm going to go with Big Ben Rothwell. And then I'm going to go Mac with Americani in a close fight in um, Corey Sanhagen. But Corey Sanhagen could get clipped. Marlon Marais looks like a little superhero. He's a beast. But I'm really excited to watch Mac one fight. I'm really sad that I haven't watched him like more before this. Um, but his, I knew about him his lot because he always throws flying techniques. And yeah, it's gonna be. This is actually really good. Like honestly, some of these fight nights have been better than the pay per views. And um, yeah, dude, pretty sick. Do you have any thoughts, of JoJo? Not really. That was a very, very good rundown. So yeah. I don't really think I have anything to add. So basically, than- if you're going to go out there and bet, pick against whoever I picked. And then you should be okay. solid. You should okay. be solid. But it's, uh, yeah, it's going to be sick. It's um, definitely without the Pac-12, you know, the UFC c- consumes my Saturdays for sure. Totally. Because, yeah, I don't know. Are you excited at all? I know that we, because we made an episode, but we decided not to post it or whatever. Cause I was like exhausted. I kept messing up names, bro. Cause I my brain was not working at all, but yeah, I'm not, I don't know how that seven game schedule is going to look for Pac-12. Uh, like, I don't know. I don't really like it too much. Yeah. I don't really care either. I'm not, a huge football fan like i like going to the games and i like tailgating and i like the whole college football experience mm-hmm. but if it's just the game and you can only watch it on tv i don't really know how excited i'll get for something like that back yeah do you know anything about like the like out- outlook for the pac basketball season or like pac college basketball in general no not really is it kind of still up in the air oh definitely yeah okay because i mean like the OSU basketball seems to be taking it like they're obviously they're taking it seriously, but like they're seeming like they're going to play. And I'm, I'm assuming if they can make football happen, they're probably going to try to make basketball happen. I would guess it's going to be pretty similar. I think there'll be probably some sort of truncated conference season, but I doubt we see many, if any at all, non-conference games, but that would, that's just pure speculation. Yeah. Do the the non-conference games, are those just as big for those schools, like money-wise, like during, for basketball? Yeah. Especially like all those mini tournaments before the season starts, like mm-hmm. the Maui Invitational or yeah. um, the Battle for Atlantis or whatever. Oh yeah. Those are always sick. It's always good to see how well you stack up. Like it's cool to see like Oregon when they played Memphis for sure and, and stuff but i mean you don't really take much stock into those games because team literally basketball team teams change so much like remember oregon like was it 2018 when they literally were shit and then they won the pack 12 tourney and then made a run to the elite eight right right is that right they made it to the elite eight was that the year they lost to virginia yes that might have been the sweet 16 sweet 16 yeah. yeah yeah but still an impressive run nonetheless for sure. I really wish they, um, cause are the, the Beavers, were they in the, um, the Phil Knight invitational this year? Oh That's yeah. Like, this year, but it was, it wasn't even Oklahoma, a tournament. right? Last year. Yeah. yeah. It wasn't a tournament though. It was just an exhibition game. Mm-hmm. It wasn't the PK 80 that year. Wasn't that a tournament style? Yeah. The they had like they... the big, they had like everybody there. Mm-hmm. They had like UNC there, right? Right. Yeah. I really like those, but yeah, bro. Do you have, well, this will probably, this will be out tomorrow. Do you think in, do you think that tomorrow is the last day that we'll see the Miami heat? Um, I don't know. I think I, it's, it's a close series. It's, 
they're very evenly matched. I think it's, I'd give the Lakers like a 55% chance of closing it out, but I could 55? really see it going <laughs> It's not that good. No, I think these teams are very evenly matched. Mm-hmm. I think the Heat outplayed the Lakers in game four. Obviously, the Lakers came back to win, but I think the series is a lot closer than people yeah. are giving it credit for right now. I thought it was over after the Heat got blown out and Bam and Goron got injured, and the Lakers will obviously probably still win, but the Heat have been way more competitive since then, since I thought they would be. Yeah, I'm trying to think. They were they were down most in game four, though, right? Trying to come back? No, the Heat were up most. To the, or it was very, very close, but the Heat okay, had a yeah. I only score. remember I watched a little bit of the fourth quarter. I was just drowning in homework. Yeah. No, it was a very close game throughout. Bruv. So, actually, we'll go through this. for So, like, the Yankees, they tied the series up at 2-2. That's crazy. This already, like... This is so off topic, but the Dodgers are literally pounding the Padres 12 to three. So that totally blows Bianca's world series prediction. The Dodgers, bro, they're a force to be reckoned with. Yeah. Dang. 12 to three, dude. Holy moly. I don't know if you're going to, when whoever's going to play the Dodgers, whether that be like the, actually the Braves, so we basically have the um, NLCS and the ALCS locked in. Do you want to do like a little quick prediction on that? Sure. Okay. So we got like, obviously, or no, actually not locked in because the Rays and the Yankees still have um, to settle their mat and to settle their series. And so they play, they play tomorrow. So do you see the Yankees or the Rays coming out? And it's tied at two right now. Mm-hmm. I would say the Yankees have been playing a lot better recently. I feel like I feel like they just had some injuries going into the playoffs, so people were concerned. But it seems like they've kind of gotten it figured out and gotten their injured guys integrated back into the lineup. So I feel like the Yankees can keep up that momentum and kind of, I think they'll take down the Rays. Let's look at the matchup for tomorrow. Hope I wonder if they they probably obviously know who's pitching that game, so. Yeah, Glass now versus Garrett Cole, dude. Yeah. And then, uh, yeah, dude, when you got Garrett Cole on the mound, I mean, both of these guys, their ERAs obviously aren't the best. Like, I think that's just considering the postseason. But I'm going to have to go with Garrett Cole and the Yankees on that, bro. They've got too much power in their lineup. And I, I really am, I really want to see like a, uh, a series between the Yankees Astros because the Astros they freaking they lit up the scoreboards let's see how many how many let's look so the Astros they when did they start they started the series on Monday Um, they scored 10 runs the Astros scored 10 runs in game one five runs game two seven runs and lost game three. And then they scored 11 runs in game four. Dude, that's wild, bro. That's crazy. And then the Bra- the Braves are freaking beastly. It's going to be a great matchup between the Dodgers and Braves, just between all their young talent. I mean, I obviously don't know much about the Braves, but I know enough to know that Ronald Acuna is a freaking beast. And so is... Um, do, who else do they have on their club? They've got um, their shortstop Dansby. You got Dansby Swanson, and they also yeah they have Marcelo Zuna, um, Nick Marquez, yeah, and Freddie obviously Freddie Freeman. That's gonna be hella good. I definitely don't see. I don't know if I see the um, Braves winning a game against the Dodgers though, bro. Unless they just absolutely pick off Clayton Kershaw. Cause I think honestly, the weird thing is Clayton Kershaw could be one of the weaker guy, like weaker um, pitchers in their rotation right now. I don't know. That's kind of a hot take, but I mean, like I saw the giants, they kind of peppered Clayton Kershaw, but that is different though. That's regular season. I feel bad for Clayton Kershaw because his like reputation got a little bit tarnished because of the postseason. But then like I feel like got a little bit like reinvigorated knowing that the Astros cheated. 
For sure. Yeah. Yeah. He kind of was the one who won that whole drama the most. Mm -hmm. No. Yeah. He got pinned for a lot of that shit. Like, like Clayton Kershaw took, like he took most of the blame for them losing like, like um, in the playoffs, but yeah, dude, I'm going to go. I'm, I'm predicting the Yankees taking the dub and I'm pretty sure they're going to come out of the AL. I've got to get, you think it's going to be Yankees Dodgers. Hmm. Yankees it's probably Dodgers. it's gonna be Yankees Dodgers, but like literally, the Yankees Astros is gonna be a slugfest if the Yankees get out of there. I don't see the Rays getting past the Astros. The Astros score too many runs. Um, but yeah, dude, that's about it. I'm excited for UFC on Friday. Hopefully, everybody makes way. Hopefully, everybody stays negative. Keeping yeah, our for fingers sure. crossed, especially for that for co-main. Sure in main event um but yeah like i said before super pump for conor mcgregor to come back that's gonna be dope hopefully they get that fight done soon he wanted it to be um the ufc wanted it to be in early january but conor wants it now i think he kind of wants to live up a little bit to the fact that he said that he's gonna this is gonna be like his 2020 season in january and then he ended up fighting he only, the last time he fought was in January. So I think he wants to get at least two in just to make it up a little bit to the fans, but yeah, pretty neat. He's going to donate 500 K bro to Dustin Poirier's, um, good fight foundation. That's some heavy hitter money right there. Just to be able to donate, he'll probably just take it out of his fight paycheck anyway, or his pay-per-view money. So it's not really affecting him that much, which is wild to think about. But yeah, dude, thanks for doing this. Wasn't the funnest thing for you for sure. But no, thanks for having me on. Do you have actually, do you want to do some predictions too? I know like, do you have, what's your prediction between Edson Barboza and Mac one Amir Connie based on kind of what I said? Mac um, one baller all around Edson, just an absolute phenomenal striker. Based on what you said, I guess I'll go with Macron, but mm. I do think like you were saying, it's going to be an interesting night for UFC yeah. fans. And then as for, so just, uh, yeah. And then for Corey Sanhagen and um, Marlon Marais, who you got there? Sanhagen. Also. Okay. All right. Sounds good. Yeah. Sanhagen, hopefully he, he's definitely going to come into the fight with a little fire and fire in his belly, but yep. Thank you, Jonah, for doing this. Sorry. Yeah, thank you. It's Always late. a pleasure. Yes, sir. All right. Bye-bye.